Uh, the time being just a little after four, the scrutiny of Tasmanian Irrigation will now begin. Uh, welcome to the uh, Chair and CEO, uh, to the committee. Uh, Minister, um, to ask you to, could you formally introduce uh, the people attending? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, with your indulgence, uh, if I could just have a few opening oh, comments I'll and I'll introduce the team as part of that. Is that all right with you? Okay. Yeah. To just be efficient. Um, it is really great to be here today, Chair, uh, for the scrutiny of TI as a GBE. Um, we are certainly here today to answer your questions and we welcome robust scrutiny um, that is conducted in a respectful manner, ensuring that all of us in this room, but particularly those of us from outside of Parliament, are provided with a safe workplace. Um, there certainly is no doubt that this has been one of the busiest and perhaps one of the most successful years for TAS irrigation since it was established in 2008. The unique collaboration that sees the Tasmanian government working with the Australian government and indeed working with our state's landowners has enabled 16 irrigation schemes to be constructed around the state so far, as well as planning for a further five irrigation projects. In 2023, the Tasmanian government increased capital funding of the Tranche 3 program to just over $118 million and the Australian government increased its contribution to $213.7 million. I'm really proud of TI and the important work that it carries out both in the development of new irrigation schemes but also in the operation of those schemes around the state. These irrigation schemes have profoundly changed the nature of agriculture activity in Tasmania and will certainly continue to support the growth and diversification of the agricultural sector for decades to come. With the recent addition of the DON scheme, TI now oversees more than 25,000 individual infrastructure assets uh, with a replacement value of approximately $500 million across 19 operational schemes. And it has the capacity uh, to deliver more than 133,000 megalitres of irrigation water each year. And these irrigation schemes, of course, give farmers the confidence to um, expand their businesses, to develop diversify, uh, to increase rotations, to employ uh, more people and establish farm gate experiences and enter contracts with processors. As summer begins, the impact of two key climate drivers is already being felt. The combination of El Nino and a positive Indian Ocean uh, dipole has brought warmer and drier conditions for spring and summer. And of course, these conditions are indeed such a reminder of the importance of irrigated water in ensuring the resilience of our agricultural sector. I do want to take the opportunity to thank Andrew Kneebone, who is here uh, with me today, CEO of TAS Irrigation um, and, of course, all of the staff at TAS Irrigation for their ongoing uh, support and commitment to irrigation development in Tasmania. I would also like to acknowledge uh, James Hipworth, who is the previous CFO. Uh, he was fantastic uh, in the work that he has done over the past year. Uh, we were sad to see him go, but we certainly wish him well. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our departed board members, John Whittington and Abigail Foley, for their service and delighted to welcome uh, directors Hugh McKenzie and Mike Payne to the Tasmanian Irrigation Board. I'm also delighted this year to be able to welcome our board chair, Kate Vino, uh, to these hearings for the very first time. Um, Kate has been a delight to work with. She has extensive water sector experience, both in public and private sectors, nationally and overseas at senior executive level, and significant experience as a non-executive director and board chair. She holds a degree in civil engineering and two master's degrees, uh, one in economics for development and one in business administration. And she certainly is an extremely valuable addition to the Tasmanian Irrigation Board. Um, Kate has a really keen interest and I would say um, a real passion uh, to see an increased focus on stakeholder engagement as we see um, the expectations uh, of stakeholders changing and certainly also has a keen interest in environmental 
sustainability. So, Kate, um, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, also on my left today is my Chief of Staff, Carol Roger. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister. I, I'd just like to mention before we start questions, the time scheduled for scrutiny uh, is two hours and members would be familiar with the practice of seeking additional information which must be agreed to be taken by the Minister or the Chair of the Board and the question handed in writing to the Secretary. That said, Ms Finlay. Chair, thank you. Um, thank you for that overview, Minister, and the introduction of your team today. Welcome. It's great to have you all here, and particularly um, congratulations to your appointment, uh, a recent appointment, and it's great to have you here so early in your time. Uh, Minister, in the introduction, you outlined a lot of statistics about TI and the assets that they manage. Um, the focus of our questions today will be on farmers. I'm just wondering if you can advise the committee how many farm irrigators are supported by TI. Yes, certainly. I'll hand over to our CEO to advise that. Uh, so, in rough figures, about a thousand, a bit over a thousand. Um, I think with the advent of um, of Don, uh, it'll be over a thousand now. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact number uh, off the top of my head, but it's um, well over. It's over a thousand now. Great, thank you, uh, Minister. Recently, uh, in the upper house, you were asked a number of questions around uh, TI and, in specifically, the South East scheme. Uh, I'm wondering in this forum whether you're able to answer those questions now. Um, are you aware of the decision taken by Taswater uh, in terms of their move to a full cost recovery? And does this move concern you? And what specifically, Minister, are you doing about this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. More than aware of that. We've had a number of discussions um, in my dealings uh, with Andrew and, of course, with the board. Um, I am aware of the proposal to uh, increase the prices uh, it charges to supply water to the Greater South East Irrigation Scheme. Of course, it's important to remember this is an operational matter uh, for TI. This is business as usual. This is what they do. Uh, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on uh, those operational matters and the negotiations and the conversations that are currently underway. Uh, Minister, my uh, question directly to that, given that you are aware of the decision to move to full cost recovery and TI have had 10 years to prepare themselves for this situation, um, which was no doubt always going to happen, as Minister, given that you're aware of it, you must be aware of the impacts that this decision um, will cause. So although you refer to it as an operational matter, as the Minister, um, what, what, what does, it, does it concern you? And if so... Um, what are you doing about those concerns? And, and do you see uh, a move to full cost recovery and, and that decision by TI to pass that on uh, to be a concern for farmers? I have absolute confidence in TI. This is what they do. They are involved in negotiations and conversations now uh, with uh, Taswater, and I have ab absolute confidence in their thinking, the way they are managing the situation and in the discussions that they are having. And so, Minister, would you describe um, this current situation as business as usual? Yes, and I think, you know, these are really complex schemes that are designed and they're really complex business cases. And, you know, this is what TI does when it comes up with, you know, against situations like this. And I have absolute confidence and have been very pleased with uh, when they've reported to me on their thinking and, and how they're managing the situation. I don't know if there's anything further that you would like to add well, as there, CEO. There has been some recent developments in this discussion. So we've, we are now in very productive negotiations Negotiations with Taswater for around alternatives to them putting their prices up. Um, you say we've had 10 years to to adapt to this. The original agreement for Stage 2 was only struck in 2013. We were advised in 2019 by the then CEO of Taswater that of their intent to move to full cost recovery. After discussions with him and negotiations with, uh, with there was the previous CEO, at the time they agreed to hold off those uh, increases, providing we were moving towards securing an alternative supply. Um, and so those negotiations happened in 2020, and they agreed to then hold the nego the price increases to a three and a half percent per annum, which was equivalent to their regulatory price increase at the time. It was only in t after 2022 that we got advised again that they wished to move to full cost recovery, which would have been a significant impost. We don't have any choice but to but to pass those costs on to the irrigators. We've been actively working with 
Taswater and other stakeholders around the implications of that on farmers and that it's not a not something that would be at all sustainable. We've continued to move that south the Greater South East project forward in quite substantially, but um, over the last, as recently as last Friday, we had another meeting with Taswater at the officer level and we were provided with an alternative to those price increases, which we're now currently just working our way through. I haven't got that in writing yet, so I don't know the full, um, the full details of what they're asking for, but uh, it's, it's looking very productive in terms of an alternative to uh, that we could arrange that would then see, hopefully, those price rises uh, absolutely minimised while we continue to deliver this Greater South East... Pro well, justify, and then, if it's funded, deliver the South East project. Mr Chair. Bailey. Chair, thank you. Um, can I start by welcoming you? Thank you for coming in. Can I also just declare that uh, I have a brother that's a farm irrigator, um, so obviously Anthony a, a customer. Well. Yes, so uh, <laughs> I have no financial interest in his business, but um, I obviously have uh, that as an interest. Uh, in saying that, I want to ask the, the Chair about your um, environmental monitoring. Um, the website says that all surveys continue to show minimal impact from Tasmanian irrigation activities. So just working through this statement a little bit, I'd like to clarify some things. When you say all surveys, can you provide a list of the types of surveys you're talking about? Obviously, water, mon uh, water quality is one of those, but can you give us a list of the things that you are monitoring in that regard? Sure. Thank you very much for the question. Um, all of our schemes on each of the farms, we have a farm water action plan. Access. That, access plan, sorry. That... Uh, um, specifies where the water is applied yep. and other measures that need to be taken to make sure that whatever impacts there are from irrigating are um, contained to the irrigation area and not um, extended out to other areas inappropriately. So that's the first point of call mm -hmm. on the... Um, that's on the farm? On the farms yep. itself, absolutely. So the first first measure to, to try and protect the environment and ensure there's no impact is, is through those. Secondly, we do do water quality monitoring and I'll ask Andrew to provide some more detail about the um, water quality monitoring itself, the program, mm -hmm. which is quite comprehensive, but it's part of a broader program that's done at a state level. So you probably understand that we we are responsible for some of the irrigation schemes um, that are applied in the in the state, but uh, we don't manage all of the irrigation, and some of them is um, private, and uh, some of it is is managed by other trusts, mm. and, and therefore um, we do a a fair amount of monitoring around the schemes that we are operating, but that information is then combined as well to look at the the broader environmental impacts and um, impacts not only on water quality but also on biota. Mm. Um, but Andrew, is there... Well, perhaps, CEO, perhaps you could also um, outline, um, I guess, against what are you comparing the data that's coming through that monitoring? What, you know, what thresholds and have you got baseline data going back numerous years that you're comparing that against? Could you just talk us through the process yeah, there a little bit? Certainly, thank you. So, um, so overall, we we have 124 sites over 20 schemes that we monitor for water quality, and these are established established monitoring regimes, which include reference and downstream sites, so that you've got a comparison, uh, and they're 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 established at the point of the scheme being justified, and they're they're essentially state based schemes for ensuring that that we can determine or if we can determine if the irrigation is having an effect on river health and on water quality. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's not only chemical indicators, but it's nutrients. Um, there's also some um, some of our schemes where we do the Oz Rivers, you know, the macroinvertebrate studies as well. Um, I think they're generally more in associated with a EPBC mm -hmm. approvals. Um, are so, you comparing them against what, what threshold or what well, we, baseline? Well, we, we're given a series of a 20th percentile and 80th percentile of what would be considered a, 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 a standard for that particular river and we report against whether or not there's an exceedance above or below those 80th and 20th percentiles. And between that, you consider it a, a minimal impact? As well, it's not even so. a minimal impact because percentiles work, you're always going to exceed them. So it might be, and it depends on whether it's the time of year as to whether the water's relatively warmer or colder, um, et cetera, et cetera. So 
it's not good, bad, it's trend data that is then provided through to the portal for um, the for NRE uh, and is reported then publicly through that process. Um, so all, all we can tell from that is whether or not um, the trends over time of those things are going to work. But they're remembering their point samples at a point in time, they're not trend data. And so we can... It, but it, it is the um, it is the uh, the monitoring regime that we're required to comply with. On top of that, we also do biodiversity management where we're required to. Um, we have a number of schemes that that where we're monitoring for um, threatened and rare um, species, whether they're aquatic or on the ground. Um, and I know we've got. For instance, we we have to do qual surveys around the um, the Meander Dam, for instance, and that was part of the EPBC approvals. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, we've got to provide um, our uh, compliance against our water licences and our metered takes. And irrigation activities, is that um, not just storage and extraction, but also its application on the land? Or how, well, do, you the how do you define that? So the farm water, the farm water access... So the environmental monitoring is about monitoring the broader catchment yep. all the way through the irrigation district to see whether there's movement, but there's a lot of different sources of that into that, of which irrigation would be one of them. So it's very hard to say that there's a correlation between any results and irrigation in that respect. But in respect of the the application of water to, to land and the management of nutrient runoff from land and impact on soil health and protected species on people's land, uh -huh. then that's the farm water access plan. Yep. And that's, that's a regime that's been put in place across all of our schemes. It's a requirement to have one in order to take water. Um, and that's then monitored and uh, audited or a selection of those is audited every year. We'll come back to that. Thank you. Mr. Sorry, if I could just be very clear on that. For the schemes that we have built, mm -hmm. not every scheme, so we inherited some schemes, not every scheme, not every irrigator is required to have a farm water access plan. Just yours. Mr. Just Barakas. the one, just the 16 we've built. Mm -hmm. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Barakas. Thank you, uh, Chair Minister. We know the importance of water and how irrigation is critical to growing Tasmania's agricultural sector. What further developments are in the pipeline? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. I do want to start by acknowledging that TAS irrigation is certainly one of Tasmania's absolute success stories. It's such a unique collaboration, um, which of course sees the Tasmanian government partnering with the Australian government and our state's landowners. Um, and of course, that's a 50% contribution from the Australian government, 25% uh, from the Tasmanian government, and then a 25% investment uh, from our landowners, um, which, you know, it, it's a great scheme. So there's investment all the way around. Um, provision of high, um, reliable irrigated water where it's needed and, of course, when it's needed um, certainly enables our state farmers to diversify. It enables them to expand and certainly produce the, the world-class food and fibre with confidence and also the food, you know, that the rest of the world wants that Tasmania is known for. Our landowners in irrigation districts that cover 41% of Tasmania's agricultural land were delivered 56,935 megalitres um, of irrigation water. And TI water enables farmers to finish crops such as potatoes and ensure yields and uh, quality were high. Of course, not to mention the, the huge um, value crops, the, the high value crops um, that now are a reality um, to farmers because they have that surety of irrigated water. Overhauls of pump stations at Forth, uh, Great Bend, Shannon River and Richmond were completed on time and within budget as part of TI's planned maintenance. Uh, Meander's mini hydro power station modifications were completed. Uh, this creates an asset that will provide many years of reliable power generation and of course supports uh, Tasmanian Irrigation's commitment to green power 
and to sustainable farming. And the Rockcliffe Liberal Government funded $5.5 million for the Energy on Farms project. So what this actually is, is that it, is it, it sees solar panels um, installed on um, up to nine pump stations and the surplus energy um, will be fed back into the grid and, of course, those savings are then passed on directly to our farmers. Significant process uh, progress, sorry, was also made uh, on some of our new projects. We have work underway on the 22,500 megalitre Northern Midlands scheme and the 9,200 megalitre extension to the existing Sassafras Wesley Vale scheme. Uh, the Greater South East Irrigation Scheme um, has been redesigned to meet demand and is now likely to be an 18,600 megalitre scheme. The Greater Meander Irrigation Scheme is, of course, growing, aiming to see um, more farmers than um, before able to actually access TI uh, irrigated water for the first time. Planning, of course, is underway for the Tamer Irrigation Scheme and that's progressing. And a preferred option design has been developed for the Southern Midlands Irrigation Scheme. Uh, the organisation will report on its carbon emissions for the first time next year after a carbon accounting project uh, was progressed. Nearly 80 new farm water access plans, which our chair was just speaking about, uh, were developed with an additional 30 plans amended or updated. The farm water access plan framework establishes those really clear guidelines for the sustainable use of irrigation water to minimise uh, potential impacts on soil, biodiversity and waterways. Tasmanian Irrigation also achieved an underlining uh, on underlying operating surplus. By 2030, TAS Irrigation expects to manage a portfolio worth $900 million that is capable of delivering 236,000 megalitres of water via 1,786 kilometres of pipeline, 49 pump stations, 22 dams and three power stations. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Um, so TI is playing a key role in ensuring um, that the Rockcliffe Liberal Government achieves its ambitious target of increasing the value of agriculture, our agricultural industry, to ten billion by the year 2050. Thank you very much for your question, Jeff. Uh, Minister, the Coal River farming region has really driven the agricultural diversification in Tasmania. Um, we know that without a solution, farmers will see water costs increase potentially up to a thousand percent, tenfold. Um, given you're aware of this, and if a solution can't <coughs> be found currently negotiated but not at a conclusion, what will you do as Minister and the Government to support farmers um, which could go out of business as a result of this? Uh, I think that, um, of course, our CEO has just stated how well those negotiations and those conversations are going with Taswater. And as I said, we are very much solution focused. We are not going to that negative position um, as a starting point in any way, shape or form. We, Of course, we understand the financial challenges that are faced by farmers. Um, we've met with Taswater. We've encouraged them to work with TI, which they are doing, and I'm thrilled with that. Um, you know, this situation needs to be managed. We need to make sure that we are minimising impacts uh, on the scheme. But I think, I think what's really good here is that we want to see this scheme go up. We want to see this scheme get up. It's it's had to change. We've had to change, you know, where it started to what it is now. And that was based on what the demand was. We went out to water sales. There wasn't the demand for water. You don't um, build a scheme... Uh, if, if it's not demand driven and we want to see this scheme get up and uh, I'm absolutely delighted with the work that you know TI is doing um, and how they are progressing this matter um, and as I said you know every scheme is so individual there are different issues that come up there are different matters that have to be uh, resolved and worked through and that is what the board and that is certainly um, what Andrew as CEO and his team are doing with regard to this. Thank you for the answer, Minister. There seems to be an unfair focus on TAS water in this when really it is now a, an issue for TI. As Minister, you've got the business case on your desk. It's in your office. <coughs> How long will it be in your office until a decision is made? Uh, the business case is not in my office. I believe it's with the department. Uh, OK. Uh, can I ask then how long you're expecting it to stay in the department until it comes to your office? Uh, until they do a proper job of looking at it 
sensibly and methodically and, you know, that's what good governance is, Miss Finlay. You don't rush things through. Um, so I expect them to um, go through that proper process um, and, you know, of course it sits, you know, with not just my office but with Treasury as well, with our Treasurer. Um, we are shareholder ministers in this um, and uh, in the meantime the conversations continue um, with the TI and Taswater. There was no implication of a rush or um, not good work being done. It was simply a question about time frames. We understand there are time pressures, however. Um, decisions will need to be made before, as I understand it, October 2024. Um, you would have an understanding of how long this process might take. What is it your expectation of that um, review of the business case happening in the department before it comes to you? Is there an indicative time frame of that? My expectation is that the work is done properly and in a timely manner. Um, Minister, can I ask through you, it might be a question that you pass on to the CEO or to the Chair, um, the water that's sold to TI or provided to TI at the moment from TAS Water is provided at a certain price. Um, water provided to farmers is provided at a certain price. I'm interested in the differential between those um, and an indication of uh, what that is as a percentage, if we won't, don't want to talk about raw figures here, um, but what um, attributions are made to the differences between the price water is received and the price water is sold. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question and I'll hand that to our CEO. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of the variable price for water that we charge our irrigators, it's simply a, uh, a pass-through of the cost of purchasing, purchasing it, whether we're purchasing it from hydro or from, uh, from Taswater, and the cost to pump it. So if it needs additional pumping to um, push it to the irrigators, then the cost of electricity to pump that... In, that that water is then added to it to provide a variable charge. And that variable charge is charged per megalitre um, based on actual consumption. So at no point in that process is the ticket clipped where there's an administrative charge? So Tasmanian Irrigation doesn't clip any ticket. We don't, we, in terms of our business, our basic business model for um, for operating schemes, it's cost recovery only. So we take the costs of running each of those schemes absolutely individually. Um, the only costs that are shared between them are the overhead costs of the organisation and only a percentage of those overhead costs because we also run... Part, we have two lines of business. One's operations and one is our capital works or, or project delivery function. Those overheads are paid for by the government as part of our capital works program, and we we I think I think in terms of total proportions, 33% of the total overhead um, costs were passed on to irrigators uh, across each of the operational schemes. But in terms of pricing those schemes, each year we sit down with each irrigator, each set of irrigators, each in each irrigator representative committee, and we work through what the fixed costs of running their scheme are and what the variable costs are going to be. And there is no profit margin built in. The only time we have a, a margin over and above the costs, it's if there's not sufficient working capital in that scheme, which means that they're reliant on TI's borrowings to actually fund them. Because we only build them once a year, means we have to, we have to fund nine months of their operations uh, of operations and nine months of cost before we actually get the revenue in to pay for that. So someone's got to have a working capital balance. But once we've got an appropriate working capital balance, then it's just cost recovery. There is no clipping of the ticket in the TI world. It means we, it doesn't mean we can't. If we have a commercial arrangement, we've got one asset which is effectively a for-profit asset, and that is our Meander Mini Hydro. Mr. Bowe. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to continue the water quality, uh, the water testing um, line of questioning, your annual report says some results were outside the normal, uh, outside of normal ranges across all schemes throughout the year. However, there were no obvious correlations with the supply of Tasmanian irrigation uh, water with the results. Uh, now, you touched on the, the um, some of the ranges there, but can you detail the analysis that you employ to be able to um, make this claim that, um, th that there's no obvious correlations with the supply of Tas irrigation water with the results? You know, like... Uh, 
Look, it's a curious I, set of words, no obvious correlations. Well, it's because you can't be black and white in this, I think, is... is sorry, uh, thanks for the question. Um, if I may yes. mistake, sorry. Um, it's, it's because... The, the issue with, with this catchment scale is you've got so many inputs. You know, there could be forestry, there could be other irrigation happening in the same district. We're taking point source samples from a reference sample and then something that's further down. We're doing whether it's what the water temperature, dissolved oxygen, the chemical, fertiliser, etc. And we just... In terms of the data we have in front of us at the time, our environmental people look at that and say there's no adverse trends or there's nothing that we can see that says that the application of irrigation water is making any great impact. And, now, And yet you can make definitive statements around well, it's no not minimal impact. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's actually a qualified statement. I don't think it's definitive. All surveys continue to show minimal impact from Tasmanian irrigation activities. Is, is the quote that I have yeah. here, but um, uh, in in that relation, the annual report shows that some results were outside of normal ranges. So can do, can you detail how many uh, and in uh, which which in which fields you know which areas were outside of normal ranges? Oh, I couldn't give you that detail. Could, can you take that on notice? Um, what? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Happy on to notice. take it on notice. Thank Absolutely. You. Is there any yeah. opportunity of? getting that information before the there end of the be, session or would it, it needs a bit more? Uh, there's 10,000 data points. Yeah, OK. We're going to take that yeah. on notice. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours just we'll isn't long enough. We'll have you have it on notice. No worries. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, can I just go back? I'm not quite sure that the Minister fully understands the implications of these decisions around pricing in the South East scheme. Um, there would be an average time that it takes, given the history and the experience of the department, to consider business cases. I'm wondering if you can outline to me what the average time of a business case consideration is for the department and if you expect this business case to be dealt with within average timeframes. Yeah. So, first of all, I say I don't appreciate the start of your question. I'm very aware of the implications of this. Um, and I think I'll throw to you, Andrew... One. Look, historically, the department, both the Treasury and the department, have taken a matter of between six, eight weeks, maybe three months, depending on the complexity of the of the um, of the case, to provide their advice. Now, it then they provide advice to the ministers, um, and then depending on what funding announcements and what other considerations need to be taken into account, it. If there's other processes that have to be gone through as if there has to be like a budget um, a budget allocation that hasn't been previously made or funding announced that might um, move that forward but uh, to to move it forward but it's generally between yeah you know, six to eight weeks um, maybe up to three months depending on what else is going on how complicated the business case is and based on your knowledge of the business case, do you expect that this, the consideration of this one would be consistent with that time frame? So, look, the, the issue with this business case isn't the economics of the business case. Um, the, the, the issue with this business case is that, we, that the level of irrigator contributions to this mm -hmm. are not sufficient um, well, they're lower than, than we would want them to be. So we still put the business case forward because we've got this... We know we have to do something about getting this scheme off TAS water and there's significant economic benefit from doing that. We have a very strong business case. The business case that we've put forward um, has a net present value of $290 million. That's... $290 million after you've taken the $300 million to build the scheme off the bill. Uh, that's the benefit to the of at the current level of, of water sales. The issue is that the water sales are at about 50% what they need to be. Now, if this was a normal scheme, if this was a new Greensfield site, we wouldn't have put a business case together at that level because we haven't got anywhere near the irrigator contribution that we would need to have to say that we've got a viable scheme. But because this one we know has an issue, we know we have to find an alternative um, and we've been doing nothing for the last four years but trying to find either short or long-term alternatives for this, um, then uh, we knew we had to put something together. It's still a strong case, but it brings with it 
a large unsold water debt that someone has to fund. Thank you, Minister. Um, it, it, the, the concern, I suppose, or the fear or the um, anxiety of irrigators in the area is, one, currently being faced with these extraordinary price increases coming down the barrel at them for October 2024, and also that so many farmers on the expectation of this water have made masses of investment, and that investment in um, our high yield and high productivity um, operations are sitting there waiting to waiting for this water. So if a solution can't be found, we will see businesses um, back out of the region potentially go broke. We'll see stranded assets in your own um, documentation. Um, uh, significant impacts to farmers in the area. Outside um, the the usual course of business for supporting these. Um, what do you see as the solutions if this business case doesn't stack up and isn't supported by government? Uh, okay, so around the price increases, I think we've been very clear that we are very solution focused on that uh, and those negotiations and those conversations um, are, have been fantastic and as I said before, really thinking outside of the box, really trying to be solution focused uh, in that space. The other thing that I think is really important is that we went out for initial water sales um, for this project and that closed on the 23rd of December 2022. Now, those water sales um, were lower than what was expected and so, of course, we had to go and we had to redesign the scheme. So, the redesign of that scheme is that it's now going to be more likely to be an 18,000 megalitre scheme um, and the delivery, of course, of that scheme will get the irrigators off the reliance on, on TAS water. So, what we're looking to do is we're going to go out for a second round of water sales. It's a different time now um, and and uh, as I said before, these schemes have to be um, demand-driven. So it will be really important to go out to water sales again, which will enable irrigators to have another look at it, those that perhaps didn't sign up to water sales for whatever reason in December of 2022. Um, they will now have an uh, opportunity to do that. Um, we are working through this you know, in the proper in the proper manner that it needs to be worked through with the department, and then of course, as soon as it comes to um, my where I step in, um, I'll be looking at this as a matter of priority Reference with my shareholder minister, our treasurer. With Taz Water, um, all negotiations you have to have an idea of time frame. How long will you continue to negotiate? What time frame have you given yourselves to bring that to an end so that you can consider that to be successful, or you need to find another solution? Uh, look, we've we've got a, a verbal indication of a of an alternative given to us last Friday. Uh, we haven't got that in writing yet that I'm aware of, um, but. We've, the discussions I've had with Taswater and the CEO of Taswater is that we really need to have a solution nailed down by March, April next year to know whether or not we're moving forward with price increases. But the as I said before, the indications um, currently are that we can avoid those price increases, but we've just got to find a way of doing it. And I just need to see the details so that we can actually start having these productive conversations. But there is nothing else more urgent to us. We've been doing, we've been, since we've been advised of this, um, we've been doing nothing other than trying to find, well, very little other, <laughs> other than running the business. It's been a major priority of ours to find a solution for this. Thank you. It's so not can I confirm from that response that um, you believe that a solution is possible between you and Taz Water and no other party, so you would be seeking a solution um, in those negotiations with Taz Water? Andrew, I think I, I may, if I may um, chime in there, it's it's very difficult to uncouple the d debate about the TAS water prices from the opportunity that we have before us with the uh, the business case. Of course. So they are intertwined. Uh, we we see that this business case is very very compelling. It's got a huge positive um, economic impact for the region and the ideal solution here is to get that business case up and running. So hopefully that will that will achieve funding, but that's the first and foremost. 
This is about a process, to, part of the process of getting there is obviously to go through the all the approvals processes for the business case, but it does need to be taken into account as well what the um, situation is with TAS Water because ultimately that business case is the ideal solution for for this problem. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. The I other really is more inter intermediate. I appreciate that, Minister. Um, that does, however, leave an October 2024 until 2029 um, currently timeframe delivery and there have been delays with schemes. So that's a five-year. Um, burden held by farmers based on pricing until that solution is delivered. Um, and so is it your expectation that negotiations you're having with Taswater now will provide a solution for the time until the new scheme is um, delivered? Look, I can't tell you what the... Sorry, if I may. I can't tell you what the results of the negotiations are, but that... What, Said no, so that's what, not the case. What, what you're saying is our intent. That's what that's what we're aiming to do. We've said to Taswater all, all, all the way along that we, we want to basically keep our irrigators in a sustainable footing and we need to find a way of doing that. Why is it has water's responsibility? Because they're the ones who want to put the price up. <laughs> but that's not a surprise to you and that's not extraordinary they would do it. So why are we focusing on that being the responsibility of them? Where will you start to hold responsibility for this? Well, I don't think we could have been any clearer as I said, every scheme is different. Every scheme has different challenges. This is a challenge that is part of this scheme. And TI have not, been working through this diligently. And, um, you know, we're, I'm actually delighted with their level of engagement, how they've continued to keep myself briefed, how they are working. And as I've said a number of times now, really trying to think outside of the box. And uh, that's certainly what they've done. And they're finding solutions and a pathway through. And as the CEO has clearly stated, it's been a priority for TI. So I don't think so, farmers well, are feeling delighted, but what I'm hearing you say is that by March um, there will be an indication um, that you have this resolved, um, and if not, you'll be looking for a further solution. That doesn't leave much time to October 2024. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by October. What's October 2024? When the prices <laughs> go up. When they no, they go, go up. they're expected to go up from June next year. Okay, well, at the that was the indication. System, yeah, yeah. Yep. The season, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yep. At, at the beginning of the season, yes. Um, so we're not leaving much time there. Do you think it'll take until March to find a solution with Taswater? I, I, until I see what they're proposing and whether or not we can deliver it, I don't know. Chair. Mr. Wow. Brackers. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I understand farmers are facing difficult seasonal conditions off the back of dry winter and a hot summer forecast. What is TI doing to support farmers build resilience? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, certainly want to start by acknowledging that uh, agriculture um, production is a challenging uh, business. Uh, that's, you know, that's not an understatement. Um, so ensuring that we have an agricultural sector that is resilient to drought and is resilient to natural disasters certainly is key to achieving um, our government's target to grow the value of agriculture to $10 billion by the year 2050. So summer is on the way and the impacts of warmer and drier conditions are certainly uh, already being felt here in Tasmania uh, and indeed uh, across Australia. The combination of an El Nino and a positive uh, ocean dipole has meant uh, winter and spring have uh, been warmer and they've also been drier uh, and that is expected to continue. Again, this is a reminder of the really important role that Tasmanian irrigation plays in ensuring uh, that we do have resilience uh, of our our agricultural sector. Fundamentally, TAS irrigation is about um, using water better. How, how can we use it better? It develops schemes that, of course, are storing water in those winter times when it's, you know, we obviously have an abundance of water and then making it available in the summertime when, of course, water is uh, more scarce. This has been a big year. Uh, in terms of progress on Tranche 3 irrigation projects. Uh, the first of these, the 4,750 megalitre Don irrigation scheme in the state's northwest, um, which actually delivered water to irrigators at the start um, of October this year. Um, that's outside of the reporting period that we're here to discuss today, but certainly is a really notable um, achievement and worth sharing with the committee. The 25,500 megalitre Northern Midlands irrigation scheme and the the 9,200 megalitre Sassafras-Wesley Vale Irrigation Scheme Augmentation received business case approval. 
and secured $342 million in funding, um, enabling both projects to be progressed. Uh, work on the Northern Midlands scheme will begin in coming months and tenders for the Sassafras Wesley Vale project uh, will be awarded in around the middle of 2024. Um, planning is also progressing on the Tamer Irrigation Scheme and the Greater South East Irrigation Scheme and the government is pleased to have received a business case for the latter project and the largest irrigation project ever to be undertaken here in Tasmania. TI is also working on an 11,000 megalitre augmentation of the Greater Meander Irrigation Scheme. This expansion will provide additional water to existing irrigators as well as enabling more farmers in this region to access Tasmanian irrigation water uh, for the first time. These irrigation schemes will ensure that our farmers are resilient to the impacts of climate change and continue to be uh, the envy of the nation, uh, certainly when it comes to accessing uh, water, high surety irrigated water. Thank yeah, you for the question. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to continue the, the theme, or to finish the theme on, on monitoring, 41% of Tasmania's agricultural land is serviced by TI. Um, we know that uh, many of those areas are, um, are stressed. You know, the environmental conditions are, are stressed and the river health is uh, stressed. Uh, and you say yourself that every scheme area is seeing abnormal water quality testing results. I think a couple of years ago when you were in here, you acknowledged that TI wasn't doing trend monitoring itself. I think other, other departments were, but not necessarily not the regular, TI. Yeah. Are you doing any... Are you, have you stepped into that space at all? No, we haven't. No, no. we, we, we comply with the requirements of the department mm -hmm. uh, when we have the... But no, we're not doing that. We are, we are working with the department on the uh, rural water use strategy and in particular the... Um, the um, I can't remember. There's a working group as part of that, which is around data data monitoring and reporting, um, and uh, we're we're part of a working group that are working with them uh, with the department about how that gets rationalised and improved, and how we um, make the um, the water monitoring and publicly available data more user friendly. Right, and so when you're making the, the sort of claims around the the impact of irrigation or or or, or absence of, it's based on the data that's being held and analysed elsewhere, not not TIs itself, right? And um, when it comes to how many natural waterways do you use for transfer of water? For transfer of water, um, we use the Great Forester and the South Esk and the Macquarie and the Coal. Oh, and the coal, yes. Yeah. And do you know off, hand, off the top of your head the volume of water that goes down there? Uh, not off the top no. of my head, no. I'm interested in this because um, is it done in... Uh, presumably it's done in batches, is it? Like it's sort of... Uh, there's a pulse, a, a release that's in a pulse because I guess we're concerned about... Um, and we talked to you a, a couple of years ago about um, the issue of this in relation to the release of, um, you know, sediments and toxins and so forth when it's when it, when water's released in a pulse from those dams no. can have a significant impact downstream. So where we have... Where we have... Um uh, river deliveries, then they're done on the basis of an order, but it wouldn't be a... It, they're not large slugs. It'd be a continuous delivery over a period of time. So it's in terms of megalitres per day, and then they have... A, the irrigators then themselves have uh, to, to extract that at the point... One, they've got to allow for a delivery time, and then they extract... Uh, what's um, what they're supposed to um, less any losses. So we would have a consolidation of a number of orders. For instance, at the South Esk, we harvest it during the winter time um, and we release during the summer, and then it's just released on a continuous basis. And and that harvested water. I mean, are you testing that harvested water when you release it on release for quality? Uh, the reason we're asking here is because. Um, uh, you know, there can be a significant build-up of, you know, nutrients and and um, uh, runoff from agricultural facilities and so forth going into those storage areas that then gets released en masse when you when that water's so released down a natural waterway. Generally, our our um, in general terms, our dams that we harvest into are 
not catchment dams. They don't have their, they have very limited of their own catchments uh, because they're effectively what's known as turkey's nest dams. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe there is water monitoring. I'd have to take this one on notice. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure as to the monitoring regime of our own dams. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd have to take that on. And when, and when you say continuous delivery, how long can one sort of c continuous um, delivery uh, episode go for? Is is that constant or is it in in batches? So and how in, long would that be for? In order, so it depends on the volumes that the collective are irrigators downstream. are, are mm -hmm. asking for, but. In general terms, it's a fairly consistent amount f across a season because in order to get their full allocation, they've got to take a consistent delivery um, and get all of their water. They've got to take a consistent delivery all the time in order to get the volume of the water that th they need in a season. Chair. Um, Minister, would it concern you if farmers raised... Um concerns that they don't always know exactly how all of the money that they provide into TI through their annual fees, um, they have they don't have full oversight over that. So um, they pay money in um, with TI's reporting. Uh, they're not necessarily always sure exactly how that money is allocated and used um, and how it's withheld for future use. Um, what commitment can you make to farmers that TI will fully um, report to farmers how all funds are allocated yeah. And how might, would that reporting happen? I might ask our CEO to actually step through that process yeah, around certainly. that transparency and... Oh, yeah. So, um, as I said earlier, uh, we provide, we develop every year <coughs> a detailed budget for each and every scheme for the fixed and variable charges for each of those schemes, including the overhead allocation uh, that would be provided to them. That is then taken to a meeting with all of the Irrigator Representative Committee where that is tabled and worked through in detail, every line item. It's not a summary one, it's a detailed budget. Um, that's in view of what the future expenditure is likely to be and what it's likely to be spent on, including maintenance activities. Just can I ask a clarifying question for their for each of them? For their scheme, we have eighteen individual meetings with different committees every year. And that and that um, that is to go through their their budgets and what their future prices are going to be and what they're based on. Yeah. Every year, they go and have eighteen discussions with groups of irrigators for their schemes about the individual pricing for each of their schemes. So that's a so thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Minister. Through you, um, so that's about uh, future pricing. No, I was about to, I was about oh. to get to it. Yeah. And then after the year is over, we have another. So part of that same meeting is you review the year before and you say, what did we actually spend? What was the actual expenditure? What was actual the work done that that was done? And then that's followed up to each and every irrigator. It's provided in summary, but the salient details. Each and every irrigator in each scheme gets provided an, an, a newsletter twice a year, once about the prices and what's going to, what's led to the prices and one about how the, how the season has gone, what was delivered, what was actually costed. So we are 100% transparent in respect of the prices, the costs, where it goes to each and every one of our schemes. So thank you for that answer. So the 1,000 farm irrigators or thereabouts um, received that newsletter twice. It's a summary of the year past on price and what's happened on their scheme and a forward looking on the budget for their price. Um, the allocation for administrative overhead, so the, the um, money outside their scheme operations, there's an interest in the level of disclosure around um, how those administrative and overhead funds, so all of the additional funds outside the um, each unique district, how that is spent. The, the, an analogy was raised with me. You know how at tax time the Commonwealth Government provide a list and say, your taxes this year paid for X percent for defence and X percent for this, and there was an, uh, an interest by farmers to have that level of reporting around um, the breakdown of the overheads. How is that reported to the individual farmers? So there's, there's a, a, a reasonably complicated overhead allocation model. Um, we provide 
provide where there's a variance, we provide a reason for the variance. If there's a difference between what we thought we were going to spend or what we actually spent, we provide them with a variance. But generally, it's to cover the costs of. We provide them this detail. It covers the costs of our corporate services group, the board. Um, and only a proportion of those costs. So, as I said before, 30, about 33% of those total costs are shared across the operational schemes. Um, we don't go into chapter and verse about what we spent on, um, on rent, on IT, on all of those things. We don't because you you break it down into individual components. We don't go into that level of detail. If we're questioned, we do. Um, and we can provide we provide people with um, that ask that information, but it's we're very clear about here's the allocation that we've that we've decided we need to recover from a scheme, and these are consistent with the numbers that we put in at um, at water sales. They're right. They're always well. They're generally included from the word go that they are now. Um, so um, yeah, we're. Farmers talk in dollars per megalitre and every dollar counts. And so um, it would be of interest to farmers that that allocation could be broken down into X dollars per megalitre for their scheme. So how much has gone into, say, board costs or administrative costs? Is that something that you would consider, that level of reporting to farm irrigators um, so they're aware of their X dollars per megalitre that they're paying for water? They know they're also paying plus um, X number of dollars per megalitre um, for the overall operations of okay. TI. There's, there's one other point I'd make about um, in, in trying to answer your question. We run a fairly lean organisation. We're only a small, a relatively small organisation. We're 65 people. Um, and only, and about half of those are associated with the running of the operational side of the business. So every time people want additional detail, it's more costs that we've got to add into their costs of running. So we run a fairly simple scheme, simple um, and but transparent. We've put, a, we've put a fair bit of effort into being transparent on these things and improving the amount of information that's provided to irrigators. Um, I mean, we can provide anything that people want, but we've got to be able to duplicate that by 18 each time. We run effectively, well, now 19, we effectively run 19 separate businesses inside that little business. So Daly. it's... it's and. Yes, I get the thing for constant requirements for additional data, but it all comes at an overhead cost. But, but you Bailey. would, you would know you, that data, though, now. You would know Thank that. I've given the call to Mr. Through you, Minister. Um, uh, the, the annual report identifies a number of non-compliances with those farm access, um, <laughs> access plans. I acknowledge they do seem to be pretty minor. They're normally irrigating outside the boundary of the grid area or irrigating on soils that are not um, approved for that activity. Um, given that, are you undertaking any activities to educate farmers on, um, you know, their responsibilities under that farm access, um, farm water access plan? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so thank you for the question, if I may, Minister. Um, the, answer, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, we identified um, a year or two ago that those levels of non-compliance, although minor, were sort of creeping up. So we, would, we decided we needed to do more, and they were really administrative issues that were being overlooked for the maintenance of the, of the farm water access plans. Um, so we've, uh, we've now looking at a, uh, and have developed this year, um, an education program that goes out before we go and do those audits um, and a more of a call, a more proactive call to work with irrigators about, hey, have you updated your water access, farm water access plan? Have you moved where your pivots are going to go? Have you got a new dam on your property? Though Asking those sorts of open questions um, because we're really aiming to try and make this... Um, uh, this farm water access plan process is really the the thing that 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 is the um, or the process that sort of uh, delineates TI from the rest of the irrigation 
world, it's one of the few... I have not seen this sort of approach taken previously to ensure sustainability and the use and application of irrigation. You're holding it up as a significant um, mechanism in terms of... Yeah, and remembering it's only applied to 10%. So our the water we applied, that we supply, is only about 10% of the irrigation mm. water in the state. Yeah. How many um, audits did you do in, in the last year? Do you have that uh, on hand? I, can I look it up and I'll try... Please. 10, 15 percent. Sorry. Yeah, forty-seven. Forty-seven. Sorry. And and um, you know the annual report details only minor minor cases. There were no major breaches. Oh, no major were... breaches. We've I think we've only ever had one that's got one or two over the years that have got beyond the minor breach level mm. and uh, they were very quickly rectified. Mm. And in terms of groundwater testing, groundwater quality testing, um, the annual report on page 29 shows that 82% um, of required groundwater quality tests were conducted. Do you know why there's, you know, almost 20% that, that wasn't conducted? Uh, yeah. I'd have to um, I'd have to take that on notice, but generally it would either be access to the bore or there was not sufficient um, water able to be gained out of the out of that particular bore. It will depend. There will be reasons why it won't be just we didn't want to do it. Yeah, and that statistic's pretty consistent. Is it across the year? Yeah, I yes. believe it is. Yes. Yeah, so, right. and we only do we only do groundwater monitoring actually in the southeast of the state as part of the EPBC approval for the southeast three scheme, mm. particularly because of the um, the wetlands mm. issues. On EPVC. Uh, sorry, just before you do, Mr Brackett, through you, Chair, Mr Bailey, can I just check, Did you are you satisfied with the answer to that question or is there more uh, information no, you'd like fine. to take? Thank you. You're happy? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Minister, I'm aware that new water legislation has recently passed the Parliament. I'd like to understand if it will impact on proposed Tamar irrigation scheme and if so, what does that look like? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Barakas, for that question. i um, certainly very pleased that the Water Miscellaneous Amendments, Delegation and Industrial Water Supply Bill for 2023 was passed through both Houses of Parliament in November of this year. It certainly represents a very important milestone um, both to enable... Tasmanian Irrigation to supply water to the Tasmanian Green Hydrogen Hub at Bell Bay and for Tasmanian irrigators uh, and one of which this government has been working on, um, you know, for some years now. The amendments to the build are twofold. Uh, first, of course, enabling Tasmanian Irrigation to supply a bog raw hydro water for hydrogen production uh, and secondly, facilitating community management of irrigation schemes. Our government's primary priority is for local communities to have the opportunity for greater involvement in the operation and the management of publicly owned irrigation schemes where it is appropriate and, of course, where it is feasible. Uh, the amendments provide for them to be um, delegated uh, response, to, to be delegated um, responsibility to manage their local scheme, um, which I know is certainly going to be welcomed. In regards to water for hydrogen, uh, supply of water for industrial use will only be available within an irrigation district uh, where it is declared um, or a declaration is made by the Minister for Primary Industries and Water and, of course, that's in agreement uh, with the Treasurer as a shareholder minister. Importantly, the declaration cannot be made if it would have detrimental impacts to existing water users and feedback must actually be sought from Taswater and relevant irrigators uh, or the Tasmanian Farmers and Graziers Association. The changes to the bill will allow Tasmanian Irrigation to enter into contracts for the supply of water uh, for industrial use for green hydrogen production. And the bill provides that industrial use of water must be associated um, with hydrogen production uh, and auxiliary or incidental use in an irrigation district, um, which is, of course, important protection um, for our irrigators. Supply of water to produce green hydrogen is also very important for the Tamer Valley Irrigation Scheme. Uh, the reality is that uh, the initial water sales were not sufficient uh, to get the scheme up um, and have it progressed, but then by adding in uh, that demand from green hydrogen, it becomes a, a complete win-win for our agricultural industry um, and obviously for, for the hydrogen industry. So it's anticipated that uh, TAS Irrigation will launch a second round of water sales for the 
Tamer, uh, hoping to be do, it, do that quite soon in order to support the scheme. Um, and our government is certainly delivering our long-term infrastructure plans um, to grow the economy, to create jobs, um, many of which, of course, are in our regional communities. Thank you yes. for the question. Uh, that was a lovely segue. Uh, my next set of questions are around uh, the legislation that was approved and went through both houses. The TFGA and their submission to that um, made a number of really important matters uh, and they reinforced that community management of irrigation schemes um, is a positive thing um, and supported the amendments to provide for that. And they see that because irrigators have a vested interest in ensuring the effective and efficient operation of irrigation schemes, um, that uh, this is a positive thing. I know that, um, and you would also know, Minister, one of the schemes that submitted to that legislative process was the Winnerlea scheme. I'm wondering, Minister, with your knowledge, I know you've been out and you've met with them, I know that you obviously went through the process of the legislation mm. changes as well. Do you see Winnerlea as strong candidates for community management? Uh, yeah, I do. I do, and I think, uh, you know, th what we needed to do with was get this legislation through, which actually provides uh, the framework work for them to make that application. Um, and without the legislation, we didn't have the lever that could be pulled um, to enable them to do that. I'm not sure if you would like to add some more detail to that, Andrew. No, no, no? Yeah. Okay. Seeing that they are prime candidates for community management and the legislation has now progressed through both houses, um, specifically what do Winnerly need to do to make an application? How do they find the details for that and when can they do it? Yeah, I'll hand that um, over to the CEO. Um, I will just add one thing. Of course, it hasn't received royal assent, but I think it's the 11th of December, so imminent, which is, which is great. So... TI now has to go through when we've got a, um, a, a report going to our next board meeting, which is in December, which will outline for the board uh, what the requirements of the Act of the Bill are. And uh, also then we have to develop a process f by which um, we make the decision or we provide we provide then uh, Winnerlea or anybody um, with the how to how to apply because there's a range of activities that they could or a range of functions that they could ask for, for everything from just being a scheme operator through to being having a long term lease of the of the asset base, but we then have to work through well how do we monitor the delegation of those activities because it's not handing over the responsible water entity status. TI retains all of the responsibilities that we've got now. We then have to make sure that that is, that those responsibilities are undertaken and honoured and delivered by a third party. So we then have to have series of agreements, commercial agreements, documents, leases, they all have to yet be drafted and we need a process by which we need to be sure that, they, that they're making a proper application. There's, particularly the Winnerlea scheme has got one of the highest category dams that we own in that, uh, the, one, the Cascade Dam above Derby. It brings with it a significant risk that we would then need to be sure that a community group has got the capability and the technical ability to manage. Um, so the Minister suggested that they are prime candidates for community management, that a royal assent will be applied on the 11th of December. Um, you've got information going to the board. When do you imagine that all of the processes and the forms will be ready for someone to apply for community management? Uh, look, I, I can't answer that question. It's an open-ended. Um, we we will be working on it. Um, we have we have nothing effectively in place at the moment, um, and so we're we're hitting the ground running, running right now because we didn't know what the basis of the bill would be. We knew what the draft said, but we had no. We didn't go and do any preemptive work based on it because we didn't know when it was, if it was going to pass, when it was going to pass, what form it was going to be in. So we haven't done any preemptive work, but we need to now put a process in place um, and then we need to allow Winnerlea a, a time enough to actually pull their bona fides together and put a proper submission in to assure the board that there is appropriate risk management, appropriate maintenance management, appropriate governance structures, appropriate dispute resolution processes in place. All of those things need to be 
in place and I don't, I'm don't. i not sure that they're documented to the level within the Winalia scheme from what I understand their historic arrangements are. I don't believe they've got those do those sorts of things so documented. the first step in the process that you need to define what that process looks like and what they need to submit for your That's consideration. exactly right. Given your um, experience and capability, you would have some idea how long that process would take. Um, can you give a ballpark of how long you think the process will take to prepare all of the requirements for per someone to be able to make an application? Um, I, th I think, um, and please, Chair, um, if, if you wish to add to it, but I think, um, you know, I, I would have an expectation that we would work as diligently and as quickly as possible in this space. Um, but I think one of the really... Um, pivotal things that our CEO has, has put on the table is that it's not all about just what TI needs to do or what the department needs to do. It's also what, um, in the circumstance we're speaking about now with the Winnerlea irrigators, you know, what, what they need to do. Um, but my expectation would be um, that, you know, we, we would support them in that process. Um, we've certainly already done that by, you know, ensuring that these amendments um, got through, um, which was the very first step and a pivotal step that had to take. So we've already shown support of our intent there uh, and now it's a matter of all the parties coming together and, and finding the information that needs to be supplied. Thank you. I'm going to ask Bailey. the question again. This is a project. I'm, giving the call to Mr. Project. I'm happy for this line of question to continue, Chair. Right. Thank you. Yep. Right, if um, this is the last one, then we'll go to... This is now you. a project. It's something that you understand needs to be delivered. Um, you are well versed at project management. All projects have timeframes. I um, am not able to believe that there isn't a there isn't a uh, project outline for this work, um, and therefore some indication of when you might complete this work. Because at the moment, um, people that might be interested in applying would like to know how long they have to get their things together, and then how much information they have <coughs> to submit, and that could go on for years. For instance, I suspect that's not the case. No. Are you able to give an indication of this project plan that you have to get the work done so people can apply? So the project plan or the list of activities that need to be under taken is being developed now Sorry. to be put to our board in De in December at the December board meeting, which is I think is the 5th of December. Um, I've... Uh, look, it's... It, it's a hypothetical, but we will do it as quickly as we can to get it in place. We're not going to drag our feet and um, and just extend this. We have no particular desire to. Mm -hmm. We're quite we're we're more than happy to have Winalia put their bona fides forward and make an application. Not a question about Winalia. This is a question. No, about no, about general, general process. Yeah, I agree, right. but equally, I don't have resources just sitting there. Way I have to go and find somebody to do some people to do this work. Or I've got to reallocate them to do this work. It's 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 a combination of um, internal process and commercial and legal drafting. It's not something that is going to take two minutes to do. So because we need a proper form of a of a of an agreement, and we've got as I said the potential for multiple forms of these agreements because there's a range of um, of outcomes that's foreseen in the in the bill, so um, I'm sorry I don't have a definitive time frame, but we're working to define what the what the outcomes are and uh, and what the project needs to do, and then try and find some resources to do it. And in, in attempting to secure the resources, you would have some understand about um, how much resource you need to deliver that. Have you given that consideration? No, because I don't know. This. We've only just working out what the scope of the project is. So um, it's it's going to take a different skill set than we've got in-house previously. It's not something we've ever done before. So it's a legal, commercial, risk mm -hmm. sharing. We don't... We don't, apart from having an operating contract with, particularly Winalia at the moment, we don't outsource our projects, our um, our schemes or any of our work. We've got we've got contractors who work for us, but we don't have wholesale outsourcing or leasing of our assets to other parties. We've never done it before. Um, Through you, Minister, could I ask a question a different way? Do you imagine it could take six months, twelve months, or two years? 
I'm just after. I'm not, I'm I think not, it's a hypothetical question, and I think we need to get back to the fact that there is absolute will on behalf of the government. That is why we put the legislation forward, and we got it through both houses this year. We'll see royal assent of that on the 11th of December. There is will on behalf of TI. They are wanting to do what they need to do to facilitate this and to make this happen. There is will on behalf of the Winnelia irrigators in in that particular particular circumstance. So all the parties are wanting to work towards making this happen. Um, but, you know, this is new. This hasn't been done before. And we need to work through and make sure that we have a really robust process in this space. But there is will all the way around. There's no one fighting this process. So everyone is going into this wanting a good, timely outcome. Yeah. Mr. Look, it should be said that it should be made a priority and um, and uh, as much detail as possible given to all stakeholders so they can consider their options yeah. And, yeah. and make their applications in a timely manner. Um, while we're on the Tamar scheme, um, when it came through the House, uh, the minister who carried this on your behalf, Minister yeah. Barnett, um, we challenged him and sought some answers around um, payment for the arm of the scheme uh, to Bell Bay. Uh, there was... Um, there was some guarantees given uh, effectively from the minister that uh, any potential hydrogen um, producer or customer at Bell Bay would ultimately pay the capital cost uh, for um, that branch, let's call it. And and yet um, it seemed a bit incongruous in our minds, you know, how do you attract that player to Bell Bay uh, when the system hasn't been built yet, the water may not be there. So is it the government's intention to build it first and then recover the capital costs um, through water um, th you know, through the water entitlements and uh, or is it going to be a condition of uh, uh, allowing that player to access Bell Bay? You know, how are you going to recover the costs and can you give an ironclad guarantee to uh, Tasmanian taxpayers that it won't be them that are stumping up the capital cost for, um, for you know, bringing in and facilitating a hydrogen pro um, processor into Bell Bay? Yeah. Um, so, look... Uh, I think the short answer to your question is we don't know what the exact funding regime will be for um, for uh, the hydrogen extension to the irrigation scheme. What I can say is it's highly it's not going to be the traditional irrigation funding regime, which is 50% from the federal government, 25 from the state, 25 from irrigators. We're not looking at an entitlement based scheme for this. Um, We've done some modelling based on our expression of interest process that we ran um, that said that... Um, uh, sorry, and, and through the expression of interest process, we identified that there's little appetite from the from the hydrogen producers for an upfront capital contribution. So the recovery of any capital that's used, whether it's borrowings or equity, to build the scheme or a combination of both would need to be recovered through commercial contracts. And so therefore you'd have to recover the cost of the debt or the cost of the equity and build those into your commercial contract arrangements. So, um, and the... The model, the model that we we went through and modelled said that it's a fairly low risk at that level. That, that even at the even at the volumes that we were looking at for the extension of the scheme, which was about twelve thousand megalitres, um, that. Uh, even if you hadn't sold all of that, you'd basically have to sell about a third of that, and the scheme would still break even over a very over a reasonable short short period period of time, given the assumption around the cost of water that we would put through. Now, that cost of water would need to take account of obviously the return on on and off capital. It would need to take account of any risks that would go with the supply of that. So. Um, uh, so there's a risk premium that would be put on that as well uh, and any other backup arrangements that would need to be put in place to secure the supply. But in essence, it would be a commercial... The, the basic model is a commercial take-or-pay contract which is locked in that um, means that the, um, that the off-taker has agreed to pay a certain amount 
regardless of what they take over a, over a reasonable period, mm. over a contract period. Can, can you talk us through, Minister, the, the timeline and the process for, um, for I guess, building that branch out to Bell, Bell Bay? Like, what is the plan in the government's eyes in terms of actually making that happen and funding it? I mean, is it still incredibly speculative and where, I mean, we've had numerous players that are, in, are interested. Um, surely you've turned your mind to how do you actually deliver the capital, how do you actually deliver this water to that precinct so that um, if one of them actually does come here to set up, you know, they have access to the water. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'm looking for a guarantee from you as well, uh, Minister, around taxpayers not footing the bill for that uh, capital infrastructure. Yeah, for sure. So it is an anticipated that um, that raw water will be supplied to Bell Bay 2027. That's the anticipation. And that time frame is consistent with the delivery of common use infrastructure required to support the development of the um, you know green hydrogen hub project at Bell Bay. I'm not sure if that completely covers off on your question and I can refer that um, to the CEO, but I can tell you that it is government policy um, for the full commercial price to be paid by industrial users. The full capital cost of that, of that infrastructure, that's what you mean by commercial cost? The, the, the capital would be recovered over time through mm. operational charges. I think that's the model that, that's effectively being put forward. So no upfront capital contribution mm. I don't by, the, a, by the industry. Yeah, by the users. By the yeah. users. Um, so it, it, it does depend on whether or not we can get a Tamar scheme up and running. Mm. Um, there is an option for a standalone scheme. Um, but if the Tamar... So we're, that's why we're trying to launch relaunch the Tamar scheme at a revised volume. We have a preferred option which we're taking to our board in December... Um, and then relaunching water sales, hopefully, depending on that decision, um, mm. before Christmas. Um, and that would see probably the, the majority of that construction completed by 2026, if that all proceeds and we get sufficient water sales. Mm. And if no, and if no customer comes, if no, if no hydrogen if no player if, comes to town, if no hydrogen player comes to town, then I don't think we're building anything. But you've already built it on the spec that they will no, come. I don't believe that's the case. We, I don't, I'm, so I'm you, not, you anticipate signing up water contracts with a hydrogen producer um, through that recovering over time the capital investment, yes. and then the government will make the investment decision and the the process will go. But but yeah, the well, minister saying the water's going to be there by 2027. Anticipated. Mm. Anticipated. So when do you anticipate having a hydrogen producer signed up? Well, co correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's going to be the same process. We've got to go out to water sales. Um, no, not not for. So oh, okay, I'm gonna... so it's, it's we're we're sort of crossing boundaries here. Um, my understanding is that there will be a process run by RecFit the department in state growth who will determine the um, the if the arrangements in terms of who the potent, who the seed or the the um, sub, the hydrogen customers would be and we know at least one has got a notice of intent in um, they're not they're a, um, an ethanol producer um, but they they're the ones that are the the, the most um, Advanced, but really those negotiations are being done now, or that process is going to be run by a separate body, and we'll fall in and support that as they make those decisions and get to the point. But I'm, I'm reasonably confident that no investment made until we've got blank ink on contracts. Mm -hmm. Mr. Requiring Barakas. energy no, as well, I'm obviously. I'm giving the call to Mr. Barakas now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Chair Minister. Can you provide an update on the Don irrigation scheme? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as I mentioned before, agriculture by its very nature um, is certainly a challenging business. We have summer on its way and we are absolutely seeing the impacts of warmer and drier conditions um, certainly already being felt uh, across Tasmania. Um, this certainly again is a reminder of the important role uh, that is played in having high surety irrigated water um, in, to ensure the resilience uh, of our agricultural sector. Um, it's been a big year in terms of progress on tranche three irrigation 
mitigation projects. Uh, the first of these, uh, the 4,750 megalitre Don Irrigation Scheme uh, in the state's northwest, uh, delivered first water to irrigators at the start of October 2023. Um, again, outside of the reporting period, but. Um, <coughs> You know, we're here, of course, to discuss much of the construction which was actually taken in that reporting period of 22 through to 23. So the Don Irrigation Scheme is now delivering essential water to one of the state's most productive agricultural regions uh, on our state's northwest coast. Thanks to this reliable source of water, the scheme now gives farmers the confidence to expand high-value agriculture at the same time improving farmers' ability to adapt to the changing climate and increasing drought resilience in the Don and Barrington areas. The scheme will also provide additional employment opportunities in the region uh, with 48 jobs expected to be supported both directly and indirectly. And these jobs will be on farm and in downstream processing and handling as well as in uh, businesses providing technical support services. The scheme has the capacity to deliver 4,750 megalitres of water uh, in each summer irrigation season and the same volume each winter to Don, Forth, Barrington, Sheffield and uh, surrounds. So in total, the scheme has the capacity of the equivalent of 3,800 Olympic swimming pools each year. Uh, it's a good analogy to get your head around that amount of water, isn't it? And this water will be delivered through new infrastructure which has been installed and that's included including 54 kilometres of pipeline, three pump stations, 67 property outlets and three balance tanks. The $54.4 million project is jointly funded by the Australian Government through the National Water Grid Fund, the Tasmanian Government and, of course, uh, through irrigators purchasing uh, scheme water entitlements. Um, the use of the scheme's water is subject to Tasmanian Irrigation Farm Water Access Plans Framework and these plans are Establish clear guidelines for the use of irrigation water to minimise any potential impact on soil, uh, biodiversity or waterways, ensuring that the use of scheme water is environmentally friendly. Thank you for Thank the you. question. Thanks for, Thanks for that update, Minister. Um, just going back to the industrial leg of the Tamar scheme, um, Minister, do you, what do you imagine the capital costs of that leg to be, knowing the geographical mm -hmm. distance of that? And can you fund that out of your... Are you imagining you're going to fund that out of your balance sheet or will you need to increase your borrowings from Tascorp? OK, I'm going to hand that question to our CEO. Are you able to answer uh, Look, it, it, it does depend on what the ultimate is. I think we've had, um, we've had various... Um, Estimates on the on the volume, but I don't think we've got anything that's that's uh, I would put my name to right now in terms of a, a dollar figure, but it's going to be hundred million plus to extend it beyond. Um, because there's an extra leg that needs to be built. Depends where it goes to, whether we have to incorporate a supply into Curry's River Dam and also all of the upgrades that would need to go back. So it depends, very dependent on volume. Um, so it all, it does all depend on the ultimate decision about how it's to be funded. And uh, if it's to be funded through debt, then yes, we would need to be and the debt sits on TI's balance sheet, which is not yet decided, it, we would need an increase in our debt, in our borrowing limit, um, to facilitate that. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, as I understand it, there are conversations going on with RecFit um, with potential proponents, but you've got one secure proponent, um, not sure of the timeline of being able to bring that to a conclusion in terms of securing water volume and depending on if there is only one proponent at the end, they will need to agree to take a certain amount of volume to um, pay back in a short period of time that capital cost which you may or may not be carrying as debt. Well, uh, yeah, so all of those commercial terms in terms of terms of the contract um, uh, is... Um, uh, yet to be determined. We have not, when, and we're not necessarily. Um, we're, sorry, RecFit is running the process with the with with the uh, proponents now. Um, it changed 
from originally we were going to be running that to, once the bill went through, but um, no, that's now basically changed. We, we understand RecFit's now running that process. We'll be told what the outcome is and there will be a decision then about the scale at which will be built as to whether there's any additional capacity to be built over and above whatever the foundational customer is to be and then how that's to be funded is a decision that needs to be taken at that time based on the risk analysis that's undertaken at that time. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Minister, do you have a low, medium or high um, level of confidence that the Tamar scheme will be delivered? I actually have a high level of confidence. I think that, you know, obviously, as always, it, it comes back to demand-driven. Um, we need to go back out to water sales. We went out to water sales once. We certainly didn't get the um, the water sales as we thought we might have in, um, you know, what the interest was uh, when the scheme was first proposed. Um, so we need to go out and we need to do that again. And, you know, it'll be very interesting to see... Um, the response to water sales, um, but it will be a game changer, of course, uh, for our producers, um, you know, up the Tamar, and, uh, but again, it's got to be demand driven. So given the reliance on the industrial water, I suppose that was more my question, do you have a high level of confidence that the industrial um, water proponent will be secured in order to make the whole scheme viable? Well, of course, that sits in another portfolio. That sits with RecFit. It doesn't sit with me and, as um, has already been expressed, RecFit are doing that body of work. Um, but I know that they have run market sounding um, and so that's probably a question that's better suited to the um, Minister for Energy. If I can go back to conversations about the Winterlear scheme and earlier um, there were comments about uh, farmers' level of confidence about oversight on the financials of where their money um, sits and how yeah. it's used. Um, as I understand it, with irrigators, they um, make their annual contributions and within that there's an annual um, asset renewal levy um, held. Uh, are you able to tell me the balance of the asset renewal levy for Winalia? And um, as I understand it, they're not aware of the balance. How would they publicly determine the balance of their asset renewal levy? Uh, we would disclose that every year to the irrigators. Don't, the issue with uh, with Winalia at the moment is we don't actually have an irrigation committee. We only have Winalia board that we deal with and they've we've recently changed, or in the last two years, changed our relationship with the Winalia board there because they are now our contractor to operate and maintain the scheme. So well, I've been talking to my people about actually establishing an irrigator representative committee. Um, I couldn't tell you now. I don't have the figures in front of me in terms we might be able to get them before the end of the session um, as to what the balance of the of the um, asset renewal levy is. Um, I can with some confidence say, though, that there hasn't been an asset renewal levy on that scheme until the last three or four years, so it won't be a large balance. Um, uh, we've we've had to since we've really take retaken over the the pricing of that scheme have gone back in and said well there was no explicit asset renewal levy being charged for that scheme up until very recently I can give you um, I think we re levied the asset renewal in FY21. I'm sorry. In FY21 at a, at a rate of thirteen dollars seventy a megalitre. That's right. And, and, but you don't have that balance at the moment of what that is? I couldn't tell you what the, what the total, total um, amount would be, but we'll, we can try and get that. Thank you. Yeah. And as I understand it, there what, may One be, million. That, yeah, great. That's the amount that they thought it was, um, but they weren't sure. Um, as I understand it, there's also um, uh, an undertaking from TI to um, add additional funds or um, to uh, to withhold additional irrigator funds for asset future asset renewal. I'm just wondering under what instrument that might be um, no, held. No, it's only the asset renewal levy. So there's no intention to attempt to accumulate um, funds for future asset? No, as I said to you, as I said earlier, the only, the only time we charge over and above our fi actual fixed charges for the fixed costs for the year is if there is not sufficient working capital in their account, i.e. cash to pay those bills throughout the year as they come due because we're paying 
we're paying people, we're paying costs, we're paying lots of other things for nine months and then we get the, um, the fixed charges are levied once a year. So the only thing that we do is we may, and we do this on a number of schemes, put a working capital builder on there, it's explicit in their pricing, and, um, and that is then held effectively against that scheme's account. But there's no intention of doing that for Winnerlea? Uh, no, there is an intent to do that with Winnerlea because they, we don't have a working capital balance for them at the moment because all the working capital is actually held by Winnerlea Irrigation Scheme Limited. So Mr that... Bailey. Uh, um, thank you, Chair. Um, j just to continue on this line around, I guess, farmer engagement, irrigator engagement. Did you just mention that the Irrigator Representative Committee, that's a sort of proposed or a mooted um, committee? Uh, and I, I ask this because um, we do get representation uh, around accountability and um, wanting, I guess, additional levels of accountability and communications with TI. So, so every, every one of our schemes, with the exception, I would say, now of Winalia, because traditionally the whistle board would have been that body, um, has an irrigator representative committee that's elected by their own or appointed by their irrigators. And do you feel like they're working well for TI? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. I think, look, the, there's an issue, you know, the, it's not people's full-time job um, and... Uh, we have some committees that are basically all irrigators in the in the scheme attend the meetings rather than just a, a representative committee. We have others that have a representative committee. Um, we need to consistently work on how we improve our our communication with all our irrigators. We're using written and newsletters and we occasionally run, if we've got issues like we have in the southeast at the moment, we'll run town hall meetings, um, all those sorts of things where we do a face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, each of the schemes has got their own dedicated scheme operator, so they've mm. got someone on the ground that irrigators can go to if they've got a particular issue or they've got my chief operating officer's number generally on speed dial. Mm. Um, but we've recently just uh, engaged Samantha Meyer, who's sitting behind us. Um, she's joined us as our manager, stakeholder relations and communication. We've recognised for some time that we can, you, know, you can never do enough in terms of communication um, and or stakeholder relations. It's always a, a moving feast and something, even though we've made dramatic changes in the last four years, five years, improving it, it, it's never going to be enough. So we always need to be looking at different and better ways and we're quite aware that written communication isn't always the best medium. Have you have you had, um, I mean, what's the level of, I guess, complaint or grievance that you receive from farmers? Do you log that at all? Do we you, we, have, a, we have a measure of complaints and I can confidently tell you it's zero at mm -hmm. the moment and has been consistently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we very rarely have, have complaints. Mm. Um, that would be, you know, the great expression of dissatisfaction. Um, uh, no, sorry, we won't say it's zero at the moment. There's probably one or two where we've got complaints, but they're in regard to pricing and they're a particular issue around South East. Mm. Ms Finlay. Um, Minister, in your introduction, you mentioned that the Northern Midlands scheme is about to um, be underway. I'm just wanting to confirm that you've got all approvals for that scheme. Uh, no, we don't have all approvals for that scheme at this stage. We're on. We're trying desperately to get our EPBC approval. Um, we've we've got, um, and we would also need to have a dam construction permit. But that's not on a critical path at this point. We've got all other approvals ready to go. Um, with and we just need to get our EPBC approval. It's proven to be a very difficult approval to get, and much more. Uh, convoluted and complicated process than we've ever been through on any of our other schemes before, um, just reflective of the change at the Commonwealth level um, as the focus on uh, this EPBC Act. Uh, a bit like the South East scheme where um, farm irrigators have invested a lot of money in infrastructure in the ground uh, and are paying <laughs> high interest rates for that. Um, and, Minister, you mentioned that it is about to get underway. When do you imagine um, that will come to a conclusion and work on the Northern Midlands scheme could commence? Um, on the assumption that we can get our EPBC approvals um, in a timely manner. Our current working assumption is that they, that construction will commence in February. We're at the process of, we've agreed a construction contract and um, 
we've uh, uh, which is within our budget, um, and uh, that's for the pipelines and pump stations. We've still got to go to market for the construction of the holding dam. Thank you. And, Minister, you've mentioned today the Sassafras Wesley Vale scheme. Um, what's the current expected start date and completion date for that? Okay. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, so Wesley, uh, Sassafras Wesley Vale um, Irrigation Scheme Augmentation uh, anticipated construction start is mid-2024 and I understand construction completion mid-2026. And that's still... Again, um, yes, so that's that's on the assumption where we've got our EPBC approvals in play, um, uh, application in at the moment and we're going through the process with the Federal Department on that. It's, again, a complicated um, uh, project because it's got a number of threatened species in the, mm -hmm. in the district, green gold frog, burrowing for crayfish, um, I don't think there's no lowland native grasses, but there's a number of threatened species in that area which we had to have management programs in place for when we originally built the scheme. But none of that is um, taken into account. Again, we've got to go back right back to square one in terms of that approvals on the um, uh, for the, that. But. We have we have learned a bit through the process of going through the Northern Midlands, which means we're getting we've gone in with a different approach on Sassafras, um, asking for a uh, controlled action from the word go, and um, aiming to have that through before we actually go to tender. So we're not in a process of being having a tender delayed because of um, a lack of approval. Are you expecting that this will cause blowouts on the um, current? Uh, cost estimations? So even with the delays um, associated with the Northern Midlands scheme, mm -hmm. we're well within our budget and the, horizon. And the well, yeah. Sassafras, we've, we haven't been to tender yet, so we, we don't know. We're still working off our, our, for our bud, business case budgets. Yep. We go to, once we go to tender, that's when we determine what the final project budget is going to be. And are you expecting them to line up closely? Well, they have done, they have done very well so in um, Northern Midlands. Yep. We've, we've um, got a project budget that's well within our project range that we came in, that we uh, submitted a business case on. Final yeah. question just about Sassafras Wesley Vale. Um, would it concern you, and I'm not sure if you're aware, um, it has just recently been raised with me, but it would, would it concern you if subcontractors on the current scheme um, who are being employed by a primary contractor are not being paid? This is a matter, I, I understand it may have been raised with you, um, but that there are people working, um, doing work, maintenance, repairs, local contractors on the Sassafras Wesley Vale scheme at the moment, um, so before augmentation, uh, and that the subcontractor is been for some significant amount of time unpaid for work. And if not, is that something that I could ask them to directly raise with you for your attention? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're the... We're the um Body that employs people to work on this on the Sassafras Wesley Vale scheme. They're subcontracting to somebody, and the primary contractor that you engage. Has we don't have. I don't believe we've got primary contractors working for us. We 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 maintain that scheme ourselves. We might have occasional people that do work for us, but they wouldn't. There's no maintenance contract on that scheme that I'm aware of. I'm happy to take any if you direct them to me i'm more than happy to deal with it thank you yep. Yep. I appreciate that mr bailey um just going back to the budget for the northern midlands scheme i'm a little bit confused um when in 11th of september 2020 uh, then minister guy barnett said the preferred design option for the 65.8 million dollar northern Mil uh, midlands irrigation scheme has now been released a year later it was double at 147 million um, the cost was reported in the examiner in June this year as being 217 million. Your website currently says it's 217.9, but the annual report just released says it's 342 million. Is that wrong? The funding that we got out yeah, the the 342 I'm not sure about. Um, That's the combined. Funding. So, so here's here's, here's the course of events, if, yep. I, if I may. Uh, and, and I guess the reasons for the cost yeah, layouts, I'm really yeah, interested yeah. in as so well. So, if I can just, yep. it, it's a tortuous course of events. We have a preferred option 
which was for a scale of about a 13,000 megalitre scheme. Um, and we took that to water sales uh, yeah, during COVID. Um, so we, we, we went to water sales for that and we got overrun with water with applications. So this is completely different to the, the other schemes we've got problems mm. with. Here we had the opposite problem. We were oversubscribed. Yeah. So now we're faced with a dilemma. We've, we've put, a, put up a, um, a project and sold water entitlement or offered water entitlements at a price. Can we now build it for the price at the scale that we've got that we've got applications for. So that was what originally moved it from the, sorry, the numbers you quoted were? Oh, 65.8 from Minister Barnett to 147 to 217. So that to the 147, we that was the move to increase the scale to go to 25,500 megalitres. So we developed our business case based on that. Now... At the time, we were moving our whole project model from being a design and construct approach to being a we do our own design and we deliver the we construct have a construct only contract. Apologies if I'm taking too much time. Too much time. Oh. Um, and in that, we'd had the experience with the Don project of the project estimate that we'd originally come up with being woefully inadequate. Mm. And, and on this... Much, so we took the opportunity, if I may, we took the opportunity to, before we... We'd already submitted a business case. We took an opportunity to revise the project budget to come up with a more robust. So what we weren't doing well is we weren't taking account of the, the cost implications of the time to construct and also the risks of delay. Mm. So we now come up with what we call a P50 and a P90 price and the P90 is the 217 million. Right. So it had a P50, I think, of 170. Now, we've when we've actually gone to tender, we've come in between those two. I see. Can you confirm, have you already got a um, Aboriginal heritage permit for this for that project in the Northern Midlands? I believe we do. I think we've got all permits apart from EBBC. EBBC. And, um, I mean, given you take social responsibilities seriously, um, t two years ago the Minister came into um, the Parliament here and effectively tabled a review that said that that Act isn't effective, doesn't pr provide effective mechanisms for protection. And one of the concerns with the Aboriginal community is that projects perhaps such as the Northern Midlands Scheme, but certainly other projects, are proceeding being assessed against that inadequate act. Does that seem like a problem um, uh, for, a, for a company that takes its social responsibilities? No, absolutely. We, you know, look, we see the act as a minimum, uh, but not just what we do. Quite frankly, if we find if there's any Aboriginal or heritage issues associated with our alignment, we generally, I think very rarely would we um, aim to remove or move through, we'd redesign around them and um, and avoid avoid them at all costs. So we take we do take that very seriously. We're not um, and in fact the south the the southeast project, we've completely avoided the Jordan levy just for that mm. purpose. Can I just urge the Minister, I mean this is a perfect example as to why we need new legislation. I can I urge you to do whatever you can with the, your minister in, in our house to um, urge him to get moving on Aboriginal heritage protection legislation because this is the kind of project, this is the kind of um, I guess disempowerment that Aboriginal Aboriginal people feel when massive projects, um, perhaps put forward with the best good intent, are assessed against legislation that the very minister said two and a half years ago doesn't provide effective mecha uh, mechanisms to protect their heritage. That's why we need a review and it's critically urgent so that these projects can be assessed with confidence. We'll certainly um, take note of that and ensure that your comments here today are fed back um, to the appropriate minister. And the context, please. And the context, absolutely. But I think, you know, importantly, what um, our CEO has said is that uh, with the legislation that they have, they, they look at that as the minimum. Um, and I certainly commend it, Tassie it, Irrigation it's, on it's that. It's worse but than I the minimum, will, unfortunately. I will, take, mm. I will take your comments Thank back you. to the appropriate minister. Mm. Thank you. Ms Fidlow. Thank you. Um, Minister, just doubling back to the question and thank you for the answer on the um, the accumulation of the fund in the asset renewal levy for mm -hmm. Winlea. 
Can I understand the process of approval or the authorisation of those funds? How, how are those funds approved to be used and how is that reported back to irrigators? Uh, so um, the, the decision to access those requires my Chief Operating Officer to make a decision. We would have to have... Uh, it can't just be used for maintenance purposes. They're actually for asset renewal or asset replacement. So a, a, an asset would need to have completely failed um, or be in the prospect of failing and needs replacement um, for it to be, for then us to use it to replace that. Now, we, we have things like um, water meters, for instance, that have got a finite life um, and you'd make a call a year out. Um, so we every year we do a review of, for each and every scheme, of the assets that we believe are to be replaced. That's part of the budget that we go and talk to the irrigators about. Um, and uh, and we have a discussion with them about what, what it is that we expect to access out of the ARL as we call it. Now, these these are funds that are held in trust for each scheme. There's a separate bank account for each one of them. Um, and we then provide them with the with a reconciliation at the end of the year as to what we actually spent the money on, if there was anything else that came up during the year that we thought there was a need to. But effectively, it's a call. It, I, have an, I have a very small asset management team and my chief operating officer who make those calls operationally throughout the seasons. And they do that in regard to the conversations they have with the irrigators, or they irrigators, sorry, or they do that um, separately as the COO. I oh, know they'll always go back and say if it's a, if it's a contentious, if it's something contentious or something big, we'll make sure that irrigators or the IRC are engaged about what it is that we're planning to do. So we had an example, for instance, last year where the pumps at the fourth pump station for the. Um, uh, Kindred North Motten scheme had been failing and they needed replacement. Now, there was insufficient money in the ARL um, to do that and because they, were, they, they shouldn't have already. They were the wrong pumps at the wrong time when the, when the scheme was built and commissioned. They weren't fit for purpose. So we've had to go back and work with the irrigator community and work out how we're going to fund it, what, where we're going to find the money, how it's going to be done, what it's going to mean in terms of outages for the scheme, all of those things. We try and be as transparent as possible in respect of where and how money is spent um, and accountable to, the, to each of the scheme committees and to the irrigators about what it is that we're doing with those monies because they're held in trust to ensure that the scheme can actually um, to continue to deliver and deliver effectively for the whole scheme life, 100 years. Okay, so in advance of any funds um, determined by the COO, the irrigators would be aware of what was likely to be... Well, we certainly have a program at the start of the year and we make that program explicit as part of the discussion around budget. And variations are... Uh, variations are then gone back through the committee. If, you know, if there's an urgent need to do something, it'll just get done and they might be, to they might be informed after the fact um, because otherwise we're talking about a scheme outage. Mm. Mr yeah. Barakas. Thank you, Chair. Minister, in your opening statement, you mentioned the new Chair's passion for environmental sustainability and greater stakeholder engagement. Through you, can the Chair please tell us what TI is doing in this space? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think from my opening statement, we've you can certainly see the credentials um, of, of our new Chair and we're very fortunate to have her and um, it's fantastic that she comes uh, with her own set of, um, you know, the, the issues that are really important to her. And so with that, I'll hand over to Ms Vino. Thank you, Minister. It's been interesting listening today how integrated environment and irrigation actually are fundamentally. We've had questions today around the EPBC. We've had questions about water quality. Uh, we've spoken about biodiversity and some of the protected species. We've talked about the environmental approvals. So you can see that our job is around delivering water, a precious resource in, its, in and of itself, into land managers who are managing that for, for the environment. I think they're absolutely inseparable. That said, looking forward, uh, the Minister's mentioned that we're moving into a, uh, a period of greater challenge when it comes to environmental, uh, sorry, to climate variability, um, to the demands on the resource. Uh, so I think that acts to 
enhance the uh, the importance of this even more. Um, Minister spoke about how we are looking at our own environmental, sorry, our own climate footprint in terms of the scope one, scope two, scope three, and uh, moving towards reporting on that. That's an incredibly important uh, to step to be understanding that. We've talked about the energy on farms to be reducing the footprint, producing more renewable energy into the system. So you can see it's, it's totally intertwined. But I think um, one of the reasons I'm particularly interested and passionate about this role is the role of irrigation in climate resilience. Um, it is so important for our communities for our environment, for our food security as a nation, that we get this right. So I, um, I bring that passion. Um, I'm very pleased and excited to be part of it. Um, but uh, so part of that is that we're building a new sustainability strategy. We want to do that in, in um, you know, making sure that we do excellence ourselves, but that we're doing that in partnership with... Um, you know, I'm incredibly impressed when I go around some of the irrigation sites and I talk to the irrigators and their passion for what they're doing in terms of biodiversity, um, understanding how important their role is in terms of being land managers and um, understand the, the critical activity they're doing for the state and for the nation in terms of irrigation and food security. So um, I hope that answers your question in terms of this is very important. Thanks so much. Jim. Yeah, Mr Bailey. Um, well, to continue that, I'd be interested to understand a little bit more through you, Minister, of some of the EPBC challenges when it comes to the... Um, I mean, you talked about the Sassafras scheme and some of the challenges there with species. What are what are you confronting when it comes to the Northern Midlands scheme? Uh, if I may, Minister. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, the particular challenges um, and... Uh, has been one of offsets actually this um, this time. There's been a material change in the um, in the Commonwealth approach to managing the impact on threatened species, and particularly for Northern Midlands, it's been um, quolls and um, and devils and their foraging habitat, but also their denning habitat. Now we're only only we were aiming to. Um, Oh, the, the project would have had temporary impacts across some devils, denning um, and foraging habitat, but only temporary, but we're now being required to find permanent offsets for that, de for that impact um, and find um, a substantial um, piece of land and have a covenant put over it in order to... Um, to uh, to permanently offset that. So that's a major change. Now... Um, for instance, we in our previous projects, we've cleared entire dam sites. We've we've that have involved denning habitat. We've we've relocated animals and done all those sorts of things. We weren't required. It. We got full EPBC approval, but we weren't required to have offsets for it. So that that's good old days, eh? Well, not the good old days, but I think we were we. It was going to be forested. It was a forest <laughs> reserve that we cleared. Um, so. We're now trying to find those places and find that that, and we're going to be we're going to be challenged as well because it has to be specific habitat to offset the the impacts of a particular um, the particular species. So finding burrowing crayfish or swift parrot or um, yeah, swift parrot was the other one. Um, uh, uh, green and gold frog habitat is not going to be the same as finding devil's habitat. So we can't just go and find one block of land. Um, that's going to allow us to say, well, we've got covenants over that for, and uh, we've protected that for a period of time. I don't think it's a, it's, it's certainly not a bad thing. It's, a, it's just an increase in the level of, um, of diligence and interpretation of the, of the act and application of it um, by the federal government. Do you know uh, the extent of clearance that you need to undertake to... Oh, presumably it was, it's under the pipeline, is that correct? It's 17.6 hectares. Mm. And does that not... That's just your works? Presumably that doesn't take into account um, any clearance that's, uh, that, say, the irrigation um, users, the farmers may need to do in terms of putting in a pivot or, and so forth, well, you know, they, clearing if, some of that remnant. If they, if they have to do that, they have to go and get their own... Their own. Uh, yeah. Forest practices plan, mm. but but what I can say to you is um, particularly the the other endangered species in the northern Midlands is of course lowland native grasses, mm. and um, our farm water access plan identifies those areas within 
on people's properties and they're basically they're, – they're, they're excluded from irrigation. They can't be used for irrigation. Mm. So they're – they're excluded and they're protected through the farm water access plan process. Mm. And, of course, the reason it's so hard... So I'm, I'm going to just give... While well, we've got a minute left. Can I just have a, um, a quick final question on the asset renewal levy? Um, the approvals by the COO to make a decision on that, do you have a, a threshold um, of an amount of money that constitutes an asset versus maintenance? And is there a process that requires the COO, once they've made a decision to use funds out of the levy... Um, a procurement process that requires more than, say, for instance, one quote or tender. Oh, so we've got a we've got a procurement process um, to go through. Um, it will depend on whether or not there is, uh, which would normally have uh, a series of quotes associated with it, um, or depending on the volume and the amount. Um, it's going to be. It's. It often comes down to a line ball call about whether it's maintenance or an asset, and will also depend on whether or not we've got money in the budget for maintenance activities, or it's 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 deigned to have fallen across the line into asset renewal. So it, it is a judgment call that's made. Um, and but sometimes there's just only one provider of the service, and then we've got a sole source arrangement that um, that's required they're required to go to and we have established delegations of um, a delegation um, document that puts limits on who can do what purchasing activities at what time and the for time those... for scrutiny has expired thank you everyone please stop the broadcast yeah.